All right. So, hey, Boban, if I turn the screen over to you, are you, um, can we turn it on and you'll be okay? It, yes, I'm ready. All right. So, uh, I'll start off with just a little bit of mm -hmm. technical background just to, to frame the context, and then I'll show you a little example and, and how, you know, how we did that. I won't go too deeply into the technical and all the nuances, but maybe just enough to give you a flavor for it. So, as Marty mentioned, uh, when we deploy uh, Record State Manager, we can deploy it against any record in NetSuite, whether that's a native transaction, a, like a sales order, an entity like a customer, or even any kind of a special custom record that we've created. And there's a place where we simply tell RSM what kind of records it should act against. And so in this environment, as an example, we have it acting against a sales order, a journal entry, and a customer. And in that definition are just a few things, some of them obvious, some of them a little more technical, that just tell it how it should behave when it is acting against that record. So against the sales order, here are some parameters that define that. So those are entirely customizable to you. And, and the way it behaves and, and even appears when working against the sales order could be very different from how it behaves and appears when working against maybe a purchase order and so on. Then. Once we've done that, we define externally a set of the rules. So for example, I have here three rules that are related to sales orders. And you know, there's an unlimited set. We have customers that over time have implemented something like 25 different rules that all get checked against the sales order, either before it's approved or after it's approved, just at various stages. So it allows them to truly act on an exception basis system checks everything as, as the order moves along. All right. So once, uh, and uh, the other thing, of course, these rules have certain um, definitions built into them, but then they are also backed by script logic. And that's really where the power of this comes in. Because we invoke script logic against these rules, we can come up with any arbitrary complexity that each of these rules checks. It can be as simple or as complex as you want. And again, some, we have for some customers some very complicated things that happen when it determines whether a, a sales order passes that test. Um, and then the rule can also have certain attributes about it that are uh, editable directly in here without modifying the script. So it's kind of a basic configuration of the rule, and then the script implements the actual logic of it. All right, so once we have these things put together, and we told it to act against the sales order, then what will happen the moment that we create a sales order, anytime we edit and save the sales order, RSM will then use these definitions and evaluate the sales order in order to make a determination whether the sales order can sort of move along in the process. Now the process or the, the steps along which it moves can be simple, let's say in a sales order you might have things that happen before it's approved, uh, then things once it's approved, but before we actually create fulfillments, and then you know, when everything is fine, we go to fulfillments. But that can vary from one, you know, from a sales order might have very different steps than a customer might have steps, or some other transaction might have more granular steps and so on. So in this case, I'm going to just do a very simple uh, an order just to show you Sample here, I'll pick, All right, and I will save this order. And at that point, RSM will evaluate the rules as we define them. And because we told it to, it shows us here a list of all the rules and their current status. So we had three rules that we defined. Location, there must be a location, order total, and sales effective date. And in this case, this is the only one that failed, and it explains to you why it failed. And um, generally, for uh, what we do, we might remove the approve button. In other words, we won't allow somebody manually to approve. We have to. We want to make sure that all of the rules get satisfied before the order gets moved along, and then RSM will automatically move it to approved status when these rules have passed. So now, the fact that this rule failed is preventing it from moving perhaps to the next status. But once there are rules that have failed, then every time a, the order is touched again, these rules get reevaluated because something may have changed to allow them to go on. 
And if in the meantime, something about the rule has changed or something about the underlying status has changed, then the next time the rule might pass automatically. Or on a rule by rule basis, you can define that the right roles have the ability to up override the rule. And so in this case, if the order total is over 1,200, we require certain people, um, for example, in this case, the administrator always has permission. Additionally, this other role has permission. And so for those roles, this button appears, approve the order total. If a different role were reviewing this, they wouldn't see this button, and there's nothing they could do to pass this rule other than having someone with a proper authority press the button or reducing the order to below this threshold. Yeah. Bob, I believe it looks like when uh, in this dev environment, the configuration automatically defaulted to pending fulfillment probably would not have that in real life. We'd have it oh. pending approval, right? Right. This, this configuration, this nuts for instance, we didn't configure it that way, but, but that would normally be the case. However, keep in mind that uh, RSM can be configured to move it to pending fulfillment, even if some rules have failed, but just not to move to the actual creation of fulfillment records until all the rules pass. In fact, some clients want that for certain reasons. Let me, let me qualify that because yeah. they may not understand that. So sure. um, NetSuite out of the box, when, you, when an order goes from pending approval to pending fulfillment, basically go, you know, you've got the sales order, just sits there. And the next thing for you to do is generally do what you see here. You click the fulfillment button, which generates an item fulfillment for you. However, we have environments where clients are using third-party logistic companies or they have their own warehouse and they actually want to generate an item fulfillment record right at that point in time. So part of all what RSM knows how to do is when the sales order meets the right criteria, it can automatically on behalf of the user generate an item fulfillment record to get the shipment logistics in play. All that can be dialed in and refined depending on your requirements. Right. Yeah, because normally once you once the order is approved, the next step is to just go ahead and create the fulfillments. But there are times when there might be still some intermediate uh, validations that you want to perform. For example, we have one client that after the order is approved, they then one of the rules that RSM performs is will this order deplete inventory by too large a percentage? And in that case, they just want it held for review so they can at least kind of do some, you know, some emergency planning because after this order is shipped, suddenly they'll only have four units left, and that's, you know, that, that's going to cause them problems elsewhere. Okay. And and the beauty, of course, here is that, you know, you can have as many rules as make sense. Things that otherwise somebody would manually be checking. Okay, is this the case? Is this the case? And so on. And yet you just want to speed along. So it can choose a hold that only accounting can approve. No other department can approve. So the beauty is you're capturing these orders, and yet you know each one is held for the appropriate reasons, and the appropriate departments are the ones responsible for reviewing and then uh, taking care of the rules. And something Ooh, like... That's great. Yeah. Uh, right. And we have, like, think of it as almost as cues, right? So the accounting department just looks at what orders are being held up that are for us to review. And operations look at their queue and say, which orders are held up for us and so on. And yet from a management perspective, you can say, show me by every rule how many orders are being held up. And you get this sort of global picture. Uh -huh, I have 130 orders that are held because the customers are over credit limit and 12 because we're out of inventory and so on. So you get this beautiful you know, dashboard that shows you those kind of totals. Yep. And on, on some of these rules, for example, um, notice, in the rule definition itself, we specified what the threshold is. So on some of these, to change them, when we build correctly, you don't have to go into any of the logic to change the rules. So I change this rule now to be a $1,400 rule. And if I just edit save, basically touch the order, you'll see it still fails, but it knows, you know, Yes. And if I were to change that rule now to be $1,800, whatever, and then touch the order, this order would get approved automatically because it's no longer above that threshold. Or because we allow an override, when I push this button now, it tells me this. Now, 
this I, I'm showing here this here for convenience. What we do, I think, with most customers is we only show rules here that have mm -hmm. failed, so that you only see a summary, really what has failed. And then to see all of them, we usually put it in a different place and color coded. So you know, red might be any of that failed, and yellow are those that were overridden. And so you can see this is the person that on this date ignore said ignore that rule right so you have that permanent history in here so do we as our business evolves have the ability with this rsm module to essentially create new rules and apply them to different types of transactions whenever we want or do we always need to engage you guys to to help right so the, the 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 rules themselves the logic of the rules has to be done in script right it when we did that just so that we had infinite flexibility in how simple or complex a rule could be. Now, Great. Um, Marty, I don't know if you want to address just how, it, you know, well, if they wanted to extend that themselves or what. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, to, to the degree that our clients want to make investments in terms of understanding how to do the scripts and so forth, absolutely, right? We, we definitely have clients that uh, have made more investments in their ability and they use our software tools and extend them, right, and so forth. More than happy to do that, right? And then, of course, we stand ready to help you if you don't want to develop that competency internally. But there's nothing here that's saying you have to come back to us. You know, Typically, we help cool. with the first implementation of it, right? Because you got to talk through the rules, trying to learn how it works. You can see it's, it's pretty flexible, so we got to kind of think it through. Usually then what that will do is once that's going, that would teach any subsequent developer by looking at the patterns, they could then say, oh, we want to add a new rule. And it's kind of like connect the dots to add another rule because they've, they've got all the patterns in there to understand what's happening. Yeah. And among, among the, you know, the flexibility and the power of this is um, when customers start getting a lot of rules, then sometimes they're concerned about, well, what will performance be like, right? Every time I say, well, sales order, it's going through 20 or 30 rules. And the beauty is you can configure any or all of the rules to not be performed in real time as the save has happened, but to be performed in the background and update the sales order when they've been checked so it doesn't slow the user down. The first time we implemented this for a client, you know, we started off with maybe eight or 10 rules and we ended up with something like 25 because once they saw the power of this, then it was, yeah, yeah, oh, we should check this. We should, you know, instead of somebody manually having to think of all those things or to have things that prevented an order from coming in. Like sometimes they say, well, we don't want orders if they have this and this. Well, get the order in. That's priority one. Let this thing hold the order then until you figure out what to do about that issue. 